T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Flight control, we have no confirmed. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Mayor. And as I mentioned, Grace Brink is also with us today. We're going to start off with a quick question. Um, so we know that sustainability incorporating into a large city such as the size of Denver can be very challenging. Can you guys address some of those challenges that you might have with um, talking about sustainability in the city of Denver? I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, first of all, we're glad to be here to talk about this critical issue. And I, I'm so fortunate. We are all fortunate to have such a, a uh, nationally recognized person like Grace Rink lead our efforts around climate action and sustainability and resiliency. And I'll, I'll just tell you that I think that the, the reality is that there, there are several things that may impinge on our ability to continue to talk about this and also to move forward our initi initiations, initial uh, activities, including, of course, cost is a big deal. This is a very mm -hmm. expensive transformation that we have to go through. Uh, but I think Grace and everyone else will agree that the cost of not doing anything is much greater than the cost up front in terms of the dollar resources. Awareness is a big issue. When you have this national discourse in terms of do we follow science, do we believe in science, do we let science lead us versus not, um, that confuses people. And so mm -hmm. awareness is a big one. And then, Grace, I think the other thing I'll just add is equity is another issue. And I mean, yeah. while people are just simply trying to survive, care for their families, you know, the conversation about what we need to do to save our planet is a big issue. Do people actually have the, the ability, the capacity, the, 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 the opportunity to really weigh in and learn more and to raise their level of awareness uh, while at the same time simply trying to put food over their, on, on their tables? I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, we've heard talk about that this morning, and I think mm -hmm. you'll continue to hear more of that this afternoon. Uh, the messaging from... Uh, about sustainability has been so difficult over the years. Mm -hmm. There's been so many, it sounds like, um, uh, you know, directives. Mm -hmm. You change your light bulbs, uh, drive, take public transit, mm -hmm. drive an electric car. There's all the things you have to do when people are already just doing things, right? right. They're just trying to get by. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you, you know, we've heard other speakers talk about this. We need to acknowledge what folks are already doing mm -hmm. in their lives um, and how you know, maybe slight twists and turns, something might be able to be di done differently and could really be helpful. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the point about cost, I think that that is also something that we really need to look at. And I think what we've all learned mm -hmm. from this COVID experience worldwide is that when we put our minds to something, when we say this is, a, this is a critical emergency, we can change how we do things. We are capable of change. That's something that I think in the sustainability yeah. world, people think that we're not capable of it. We yeah. are, we are capable of change. Yeah. And I think that that's what makes us all so hopeful that we know that we can. Um, and you talk about some of the messaging. How are you guys working on some of your messaging to the um, audience, to the public, and how they can create change, whether as businesses mm -hmm. or individuals? Like, what, how can they be in, active with that? I think one of the most important things that we need to do first is listen, <laughs> right? We absolutely have to listen to people in their communities. We need to listen and hear from businesses what works for them, what doesn't. And then we tailor the programs that we offer as, at a, a city to meet those needs. I think that's the first most important thing we need to do. Let me join Grace in that thought because I think the worst thing uh, the movement can do is to be such a uh, directing, a uh, top-down kind of a conversation because it comes off as too elitist. And again, it will turn people off. And then you'll never get them back because they'll always say that conversation is not for me. It's for those who can mm -hmm. afford to go solar. It's the, for those who can retrofit uh, utilities so that, uh, are, you know, so they can have, you know, clean energy producing uh, heat and, or, or, you know, zero energy uh, electricity in their home. Th these are the things that, you know, we got to be really careful of. And, and so listening, engaging, and making people feel like, one, it's their idea, but also this is something that they're going to benefit from, not only today, but in the long term. As a business, small business owner in the community, I automatically am all about sustainability. Right. But what can like other small businesses do to help kind of help you guys and help push the message forward that you guys are trying to offer to the community? Well, I think one of the things that we've always said is you can lead by example. And if you have composting and recycle bins in your office, that is a you know an indication for me anyway. Whenever I'm in the office, this is an mm -hmm. indication that this is a company that's tuned in. Um, you can also work to um, reduce your footprint by, you know, uh, utilizing clean energy as best as you possibly can, uh, reducing your, your electric outputs, uh, making sure that the whole office is conscious, conscious about what they're doing in order to help reduce 
uh, their use of, uh, of, uh, of energy. And so those are the things I think start, but by leading, you lead by example. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there are little things they can do that, are, that quite frankly are pretty powerful. And I would add, please have all businesses of any size go visit our website and look for um, Certifiably Green Denver. It's a program that we've been offering for a long time. It's um, certification for businesses that already have sustainable practices, but frankly, it's a really great point of entry for businesses that haven't started yet and who are looking for resources. We have very talented um, staff who are eager to get back out into the community. You know, we've all been hamstrung by this COVID situation, but there are virtual services we can provide as well as in-person visits. And we're actually looking forward this next year to providing small grants through our, sm through our Certifiably Green Denver businesses as well. That's and I can just ask some specific things. One is uh, think about transit corridors where you locate your company mm -hmm. near transit, uh, encourage your employees to bike if they can, walk if they can to the office, take transit, maybe pay for their eco passes, um, give them a benefit that uh, maybe they didn't expect but would save them a lot of money but also help with our, our GHGs. Speaking of leading, so when it comes to what is, why is it important to be one of our leading cities in, um, around the sustainability issues? And, you know, other cities, I think, look to the city of Denver and what we're doing and how we can be a leading city in the, in the issues. I'll, I'll go ahead yeah. and start. I would say one of the things that I keep in mind always is that the majority of people on this planet live in cities. It's mm -hmm. over 50% now. It's around 55%. And by 2050, it could be close to 70%. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely crucial that cities lead. It's where the people are. It's where we're generating the emissions. And there's so much work we can do. What I also like about remembering that is if all cities or a majority of cities around the world band together and do this work, then when there's an absence of leadership, at our national level on these issues, we can still make a lot of progress. Yeah, I think that's why you saw a lot of cities, uh, to Grace's point, move very quickly to say, to rebuke any national call to get out of the Paris Accord and come back and say, no, we're staying in. Uh, because we recognize that cities have to lead. Uh, we recognize that if Denver, for example, sets the example, we can bring in the rest of the region, ultimately the rest of the state, uh, on whatever benchmark we're working on, um, and we can't do it by ourselves. We're not islands, uh, you know, by ourselves. And so, you know, we can try to do everything we can to reduce, you know, carbon emissions. But at the end of the day, if neighboring cities aren't doing it, what's the point, right? So we've got to do this together. And that's why it's important that we all lean in collaboratively and, and that we work together on, um, you know, collective benefit. And again, as individuals, how can we help you with that? Is there a way that you're into, like, your constituents can help and Absolutely. be a part of it. Hold us all accountable and, yeah. and let it make it make it very clear. You want us to continue to prescribe to those new benchmarks and new opportunities that exist. You want composting. You want recycling. You want uh, a pay-as-you-throw system. You want bike lanes. You want uh, transit, good transit. You want walkable. You want a walkable city. You want uh, density near transit corridors. You, those are the things that I think not only meet us where we are today, but ultimately uh, prescribe for a better, brighter, better future going forward. So constituents are guiding all these things. All of them, you think about everything that we're doing, mm -hmm. the legacy from Hickenlooper's Million Tree Initiative and, and his, uh, his uh, uh, what was the name Green of the Green, Green Print Denver office, mm -hmm. to our Office of Sustainability, and now the Climate Action and Sustainability Resiliency Office. That all comes from constituent engagement saying, this is important to us. Yeah, I would say that I think it's very clear the job that I have, the office that I'm leading, mm -hmm. wouldn't have existed if we didn't have a groundswell of support from mm -hmm. residents and businesses in Denver. So although, you know, you know extraordinary leadership is also required, mm -hmm. but he, the mayor is able to do this work because he has the support of the people, right. and the people are holding him accountable. And I think it's, it's a little bit of an infinity loop, mm -hmm. you know, how that goes. So you have leadership that's open to the community's ideas, mm -hmm. and the community tells them those ideas, and then those ideas come to fruition. Kind of over with that is, you know, state policies. Like, how, how do state policies help or hinder what you're trying to do at the local level? Is that... Um, make some changes for you? Yeah, yeah. I think legislation matters. Obviously, the disposition of the governor and the governor's uh, values ex are extremely mm -hmm. important. 
um, the, the state leaning in and leading on these issues are extremely important. So when you saw as the 2019 legislature did pass laws that really enable the cities and municipalities to craft even uh, even better policies and, and know that we have a collective partnership uh, and, and collective values uh, that we agree on, I think that's pretty powerful. I think it is really important that um, states and regional uh, entities, mm -hmm. uh, regulatory entities are engaged because our jurisdiction does stop at the city line. And there are a lot of issues in this field that we simply cannot regulate. So when it comes to air emissions and transportation issues, um, you know, our energy grid, all of that is regulated at a regional and state mm -hmm. level. And so we are a participant in that, but we mm -hmm. absolutely need um, support at the state level and from those regulatory agencies. And I think here in Colorado, we have it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the mayor just mentioned, in 2019, there were a number of bills passed at the state level that really help advance our goals. Um, and I think we've got really good support at it from our regulatory agencies as well. And um, kind of moving forward, looking to the future, you know, what, what do you guys envision? What is like the big picture? You know, what is your legacy that you want to leave um, when, you know, to the next person that comes in or to the next executive director, you know, whoever, what is the future for what you envision? I'll let you go first. Oh, you'll let me go first. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Well, first off, there's so much that, you know, that goes into creating a new office, right? So we have this new office was created by combining two existing offices. So we really need to look at our mission. And there's sort of a plan A, plan B approach that we're taking. You know, the plan A is um, what happens if we, uh, if, if we continue with the same number of staff and the same type of um, you know, uh, funding that we have available to us, what are the really meaningful and impactful programs that we, can, um, that we can go out and reach the people with? What are the policies that we as a city can implement that will really help move the market locally? And that we can do within ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, plan B is what happens if things change? What happens if, um, you know, if regulatory issues change and we end up having uh, more funding or more local support for the type of work we do? Mm -hmm. You know, what are, the, what are the bigger programs that we can implement? And so that's what our staff are working on every day is figuring out now how much more can we push the envelope with the resources that we have available and then as our economy rebounds and as our mm -hmm. opportunities grow what more can we do then yeah I think you started this conversation by saying change is not only challenging but it's also long term mm -hmm. it's not done overnight and the, the reality is is that this is a culture and a value that we're trying to lay the foundation for that continues way beyond us um, this is not a program for us this is quite frankly a value that we are trying to leave with the city of Denver and a new culture, a new way of thinking, that we control the health and the well-being and the sustainability of our earth, our space, and we have to do certain things, and, and, and that is to be more efficient and conscientious on how our actions impact that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, we're trying to do. And I think you see kind of the lineage uh, from green print to office sustainability to office of KSER. Uh, that's climate action yeah. sustainability. That's how I remember it. <laughs> sure. um, um, but uh, you see that, but you also see us beginning to broaden our footprint each time. Yeah. We're broadening our stance. We're being more inclusive. And, you know, we may be talking about roads and building building street uh, bike lanes or, or wider sidewalks for people to walk. And that all goes toward exactly what we're trying to drive here. And the more we think about it, it's a more comprehensive approach. Um, and we're more inclusive. Biking is something that everyone can do. It's a game changer. It's a level the playing field um, kind of activity. We can make a difference from folks. Putting people, affordable housing or transit, that changes the game for families that struggle. Mm -hmm. It gets them to move around and it breaks them out of poverty um, because the greatest indication of poverty is where you have limited mobility options and that's a game changer yeah and i denver is definitely going to be the game changer yeah. and right. so excited for that and do you feel that covid has has kind of made an impact on how you go forward with some of those changes i mean grace and i kind of were talking kind of beforehand and i think that you know my world of sustainability mm -hmm. i see that people are starting to open their eyes mm -hmm. you kind of see that on that bigger level well, for those of us who do inside baseball, we saw our air get much cleaner <laughs> yeah. during COVID because people were home. So we kind of make the connection, driving to work every day, congestion, congested air. Right. I think, you know, going back to your point, your question about, you know, what is the vision? I think all these things the mayor mentioned, 
bike lanes, walkable sidewalks, mm -hmm. um, transit-oriented development, making sure we have affordable housing right here in the city. Yeah. These are all the, the stepping stones and the building blocks to a world where we don't lose sight of right. the mountains for two months mm -hmm. because of poor air quality. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's the vision. Great so concept. that is that's the long-term vision that we want. We don't want our brothers and sisters in California and the Pacific Northeast to be run from their homes from wildfires for months at a time. We don't want our brothers and sisters on the Gulf Coast to be inundated with a month-long hurricane that just doesn't let up. So the number of hurricanes may, may not have changed much over time, <laughs> but the intensity of them <laughs> changes a lot. Boom. You know, we yeah. don't want our brothers and sisters in, in New yeah. York and the rest of the East Coast also being inundated and run from their homes because of rising sea level. So that is a long-term vision, but it takes these individual steps mm. along the way to get us there. Um, as we wrap up, is there any kind of last minute you know, things you guys want to throw out there about what individuals can do or businesses or just kind of talking about the last kind of wrap up on climate issues in the city? Mine's very simple. Educate yourself. Yeah. Um, because I think if you educate yourself, we can get beyond this politicizing of climate action. Um, it, it, nothing, I think, has been more damaging than to play games with what we are all learning. You know, I, people say, I don't, the science is not lead us. I don't know about you, but I have never been in school without having to take a science class. And, and I've come to believe in science as a result of that. And the more you educate yourself, the hopefully the, the better you, we all act through that education. So we've got to stop politicizing the issue because ultimately it's going to impact all of us. Uh, down the road if we don't get smarter about this. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add is um, to ask people to lead with hope, yeah. right? We don't want people to think that this is a doomsday scenario that we're talking about all the time. We really want to think about what is the positive future that we want for ourselves mm -hmm. and to lead with that. And, and that makes it much easier to take mm -hmm. those steps towards the change that we have to do as individuals and we have to do as society. But leading with hope is so much more fun. Um, so much more engaging than, say, than trying to run from a disaster that you're afraid of. So I'd say lead with yeah. hope. I agree. It is much more fun, and this has been such a wonderful opportunity. Um, you also get that roll off your tongue of the Office of Climate Action, Sustainability, and Resiliency. Great. Um, <laughs> I told you I'd have it. So everybody, please help me in saying a huge thank you. <laughs>